Grace and peace in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we gather in person and virtually to praise God, hear the good news, and be equipped for ministry in the world. Let us prepare ourselves to worship God. Thank you. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Paul's message to the believers in Rome continues to offer spiritual guidance and practical advice to the community of faith while they remain in a waiting time. In today's reading, he focuses upon the work of the Spirit, of the assurance that God knows what needs to be done, and that in Christ we know God's love for us. I'm reading from the message. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Him. After God made that decision of what His children should be like, He followed it up by calling people by name. After He called them by name, He set them on a solid basis with Himself. And then, after getting them established, He stayed with them to the end gloriously completing what he had begun. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture, which say, they kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. Nothing faces us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Let us listen carefully to the reverently to Jesus' love speaking. Jesus loves me, this I know. Yes, Jesus. 
In an update we received from Marguerite's brother yesterday, he notes that plans continue for her to be in nursing care for some time. She appreciates the cards, notes, and letters that she's receiving, but she is distressed that she is able to do so little. So please keep Marguerite, her family, in our prayers. Lois Kohlbacher learned that her daughter's family who live in Tennessee have tested positive for COVID-19 and asks prayers for them. We offer thick prayers and sympathy to Helen Barringer, who lost a longtime friend this week to an automobile accident. So I invite you to please keep these person and all the others whose conditions are precarious in our prayers. Let us enter now into a time of intentional communal prayer. Gracious and loving God, so many people and so many circumstances are breaking our hearts this week. And we struggle with how to offer solace and hope to others. And so we come to you, asking that you will be in the midst of these struggles, and that you will guide us in responding with love and mercy. We pray for those who are ill or injured, who are awaiting diagnoses, treatments, and procedures, and for those whose healing will be only in the life to come. Praying for strength to endure, peace to reassure, comfort to ease pain and anxiety. For those who struggle and those who share their sins. God of all mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who grieve, for any who have lost a loved one for death, For those who are estranged from family and friends. For those who have lost a job, an opportunity, or something that is important to them. God of all mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for any who are in danger. For those in the paths of natural disasters, for any who live in homes, communities, or countries filled with violence, for those who are persecuted or attacked because of their race, ethnicity, gender, or religious practices. And for those who commit violence upon others by legal or illegal means. God of all mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the created world and for the world created by human institutions and behaviors. We pray for elected, appointed, and employed leaders who are responsible for our common welfare. And for those whose voices, choices, or resources affect many lives. We pray for our battered and bruised creation to be protected and renewed so that its gifts may sustain life. We pray for citizens who work together for the good of all. God of all mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the body of Christ in the world, for faithful disciples, apostles, missionaries, and teachers who share the good news with words 
and acts of justice and mercy. We pray for Bishop Palmer and Superintendent Roper and all who lead with him. We pray for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon us in this congregation, guiding our lives and actions in ways that are pleasing to you, spreading grace and mercy in the name of Jesus Christ. God of all mercy, hear our prayers. We pray in the communion of the saints using the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or spirit for the proclamation of the gospel.
Let us pray. Oh God, who is eager to be known by us, but who challenges us to discover you for ourselves. Give us guidance in the ways we might search, and the clues you offer us for the life and ministry of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, who among us has spent at least a little of your staying home time working on a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. You know, there was actually a run on puzzles that were in short supply, and people were exchanging puzzles with friends who wanted to have something to do. Next question. Who works at least one puzzle daily? The Sudoku, crossword, word search, jumble, hidden objects? Now, this is a question for the real pros. Who works your puzzles in ink? <laughs> All right, we got a couple. Good for you. Puzzles challenge us to figure things out and come up with the right answer, the right picture, the right word, the right sequence of numbers. You know, puzzles date back to ancient civilizations. But one of the newest forms of puzzle fun is escape rooms. Anybody here been to an escape room? Okay. Most of the time, puzzles have a specific answer. Pro jigsaw puzzlers often look for the outer edges first, knowing that once that frame is filled, it will help them fill in the center. One wrong word in a crossword can draw off the entire puzzle making it almost impossible to solve. You know, we've had those puzzles with the rings that you're supposed to untangle. Well, if you can't figure out how the rings come together, we're not able to get that apart. And usually, but not always, once we've solved a puzzle, we can do it over and over again to the amazement of the people who can't figure it out. Well, in a way, when Jesus tells a parable, he's setting up a puzzle. Now, sometimes we don't realize it's a puzzle because we don't know what's all about the story. For example, when Jesus says a little tiny mustard seed can become a tree-sized giant, a plant, we think it's about something little bit big. Now, way back in the day, how many of us received a mustard seed enclosed in a glass bubble? I'm not the only one. And we wore that as a, a necklace or on a keychain to remind us even a little bit of faith will grow large in us. And that is one way we can think of the parable. But anyone who knows how to grow mustard, does anybody here grow mustard? I, I buy mine at the grocery store. Um, but anybody who knows how to grow mustard would hear that parable and go, huh? Because they would recognize that mustard is an annual plant. It's a her an herb, and it starts fresh each growing season. No way would any mustard plant grow large enough to be called a tree, let alone have birds nest in it. A puzzle indeed. So what is Jesus trying to say about the kingdom of heaven? It's much easier if it's little to big than something happens that defies our experience or ability to explain. Now about one third of Jesus' teachings are in the form of parables. You know, the ones that we heard earlier, earlier are kind of grouped together and called kingdom parables. Stories that are intended to tell us something about what happens when God is in charge of the world and of our lives. Now, although we sometimes think of the kingdom of heaven as what will happen when we die, the clues Jesus is offering are really meant for us now. Not later. A 
Herbalism intended to be like Aesop's fables that provide a moral lesson for whatever happens? Nor are the parables like folk stories that describe how things came to be the way they are. Parables are meant to puzzle us, to help us make connections between what we know and what can't be known or described with our limited vocabulary and understanding. The Latin from which the word parable comes means it actually means to throw alongside. So, so when we ask, well, what does alligator taste like? And someone replies, well, you know, it's a lot like chicken. That's throwing something we don't know alongside something we do know. Now, not having eaten an alligator, nor am I intending to do so, I can't comment on how closely it resembles chicken. You know, but even chicken varies in taste from light to dark and from light to fine. So, I guess there's no definitive answer to what alligator tastes like. And that's kind of the way Jesus' kingdom parables work. Jesus' parables challenge us to figure out what God's reign is like and how that affects us and the world. So instead of learning a, a, a kind of set rule that may or may not apply to our situation, through parables we receive the gift of applying Jesus' wisdom to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Now let's go back to that mustard seed. Sometimes we may need the encouragement to hold on to the little bit of faith we have. When the diagnosis is not good, when we're exhausted from doing hard work that shows little or no bones, when we don't know which way to turn, when our career our family life is in shambles, when our world feels like it's spinning out of control, that little mustard seed will be exactly what we need to keep going. But then there's some other time. Maybe we've been asked to do something that we never imagined ourselves doing. Maybe someone has said, you know, you would make a good teacher because of the patient and clear way in which you describe things. You might be surprised by that announcement because we don't recognize our own gifts and talents. Any number of clergy would tell you that the first time someone said, why don't you go to seminary? You would make an outstanding pastor. They were stunned, and then we looked for a polite way to say, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> and even when our secret hearts are really set on becoming a doctor, a nurse, an airline pilot, we just can't see how we can possibly manage the education, the expense, the challenge. Because we're mustard seeds who can't become trees. Except, of course, in Jesus' understanding of the kingdom of heaven. It's a puzzle indeed, but it's not like a jigsaw where the frame defines the image. And it's not like crossword is Sudoku that can't be solved until all the correct answers are filled in. Here's a little hint about another of Jesus' parables. Now Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one very precious pearl, he went and sold all that he owned and bought it. Now had Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like one precious pearl, we have accepted that the kingdom of heaven is beautiful, the kingdom of heaven is valuable, 
the kingdom of heaven is desirable. And that's all good. And it's maybe all true. But that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said the kingdom was like the merchant who searched for a pearl, not the pearl itself. Well, what, what kind of merchant sells everything to buy one pearl? Merchants are in business to make a profit. And generally what that means is buy low and sell high. Um, as my mother used to say to some people, you know you can make money if you buy them for what they're worth and sell them for what they think they're worth. So what might this merchant represent as the way things operate in God's preferred world? Who is the merchant willing to give everything for one precious pearl? And what might that pearl be? Now, as for the woman and the yeast, most of us know what yeast does to flour, right? And, and you don't have to hold your hands up, but some of us know what yeast does to hops. And those of us who like nice, airy bread or beer are happy to have yeast. But the yeast in the story was a contaminant, something that altered the state of the bushel of wheat. Furthermore, Jesus says the yeast was hidden. That's not a way anyone would describe the bread-making process. And by the way, unless we have a huge oven and plenty of people to feed, that recipe has been multiplied way too many times. So, okay, the people got the net. It does sound a bit like end time theology, where the bad fish get thrown into the fire and the good fish get stored in the containers. But what if it's not? Remember, even the fish who get put in the containers are destined to be eaten up. Think about that as an image for the kingdom of heaven. And then Matthew's gospel ends this session of parables with Jesus asks, asking, are, are you starting to get a handle on this? To which the disciples reply, yes. Now, let me give you a word of caution. Be very, very careful when you say yes to Jesus. <laughs> Where did you go? And then here's Jesus' response to the yes. Well, then you see how every student well trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. Now that translation is by Eugene Peterson in the message. And his goal is always to capture the essence of what Jesus might be saying, not necessarily a word-for-word -word translation. In Tip City, when I was growing up, Butler's Variety Store on Main Street was as close as one could come to a general store. Anybody been to Butler's? Well, we, mostly we loved the penny candy counter, and it really was penny candy, and we visited it regularly. Oh, but there were many other treasures to be had, including buttons. Stationery, records, kitchen gadgets, and even some hardware items, clothing, who knows. But unless we wanted to spend an endless amount of time searching through the many things that were on the tables and shelves, we asked Mr. or Mrs. Butler to find the item for which we were looking. They knew whether or not they had the item and exactly where to find it. The Busy Beaver Craft Shop is in Beaver Creek is the same kind of place. They stock everything from the newest craft items to crochet thread that exactly matches what my grandmother used to make doilies 50 years ago. So that image, what we need, 
exactly when we need it, and someone able to lay his hands on it, is an amazing description of Jesus' kingdom parables and how they may be helpful to us as we live and serve. So this week, let's try our hands at a new kind of puzzle. A puzzle that challenges us to discover God's will in this moment, in this time, in this place for us. Look for an answer but will set us on a path of wholeness and health and grace. Take joy in whatever the answer appears from our puzzle efforts and be amazed at the way God is revealed to us. Oh. And for those who may be wondering what on earth is printed on our bulletin cover and is on the screens, if you look carefully, you will discover. Well, to tell you the answer would spoil the fun. When you figure out what it is we're looking at, remember that some puzzles have more than one right answer. And for that, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let's uh, listen once again as Dave sings, The Spirit sends us forth to serve. And now as we go, go with a song in your heart, a puzzle, puzzle in your brain, and the joy of Jesus Christ, who loves us all, no matter what. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.